Welcome to Lessons from the Playroom. In this podcast, Lisa Dion will help you explore the little things that make a big difference in play therapy. Lisa is a founder of Synergetic Play Therapy. You know, sometimes therapists get all caught up trying to study big theories and mastering techniques to help children like me. But sometimes it's the little things we show you along the way that make the biggest difference. Join Lisa as she teaches you some of the little lessons that children are trying to communicate to you so that you can help us in the best ways possible. And on behalf of all the kids you work with, thanks for listening and believing in us. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to this particular episode from Lessons from the Playroom, where I'm going to discuss a topic that every one of us has to deal with every single time we meet with a child, and that is how to end the session. I'm going to get into different ideas and ways of supporting children, making that transition from the playroom to out into the waiting room, which is usually where that happens or how that happens. And I'm going to give you a little bit of the neuroscience behind some of the ideas I'm going to offer. And we're going to make our way a little bit later in the podcast into a larger discussion of endings and transitions, which is what do we do when we realize that it's time to terminate and how do we manage that particular ending? I'm going to then be concluding this particular podcast with a discussion on the use of a transition object, and I'm going to share with you what I use as a transition object and why I love transition objects so much. Now, over the next 30 minutes of this podcast, you're going to hear different ideas. I'm going to give you examples of language that I use with kiddos. I'm going to share with you just some thoughts that I have. And what I want to say is, you know, take what works for you and leave what doesn't. I really want you to listen to this episode from the standpoint of these are ideas and suggestions, but at the end of the day, you have to do what feels most congruent for you. For those of you that have studied with me, you'll know that I truly believe that authenticity in the playroom is the number one thing that really supports us in becoming phenomenal play therapists. So I'm going to say that even with the information I put out, not only in this episode, but in any episode that you listen to me present, which is use this as ideas, take what works for you, leave what doesn't, enjoy listening to these episodes, learn something, help yourself expand your thinking. And at the end of the day, what's authentic to you is what's authentic to you. So the first thing that I want to talk about are the endings of the sessions themselves. And then we'll slowly work our way out to the ending of the play therapy process as a whole. But I want to first start um, session to session. Now, sometimes you may find that the ending is really fluid. It's really easy. Um, The child is told that it's time to end and the child transitions really well and they go out and meet their parents in the waiting room if the parents weren't in the session and not a big deal. Other times you may find that it's a real challenge of a process. The child either does not want to leave, they're refusing to leave, they won't engage you in the transition itself. There's a lot of resistance in the, in the transition. And so that's what I want to talk about. I want to give you some tips and ideas for when the ending is hard. Now, if you haven't listened already to some of the previous podcasts where I've discussed the threats in the brain, I'm going to give a little bit of a reminder here, and I would encourage you to really go back and listen to some of the earlier uh, episodes where I discuss this in more detail. But one of the main threats of the brain, um, and when I say that, what I mean is we're bringing in sensory data, and the amygdala in particular in our brain is scanning to see if there's any threat or challenge attached to that sensory data. And one of the things that it's scanning for is what I call the unknown. Now, the unknown itself 
is not the scary piece. And I, I say that every time I teach this because I think this is, there's a nuance here that's really important to understand. The unknown itself is just a moment. It's, it's just a moment of all possibility. There's nothing bad happening in that moment. There's also nothing good happening in that moment. It's, it's just a, a new moment unfolding, if you will, right there. And, and so the unknown itself isn't scary. It's what we put into the unknown that actually creates the fear. So what we do is because we don't know what's going to happen in the unknown, we don't know what we're going to encounter in the unknown. What we often do is we take things from our past and our history that in our perception didn't go so well, or maybe we saw that it didn't go well for someone else and we put it right there in the unknown and we make an assumption that we somehow are going to experience that too, which of course we have no evidence of, but our mind tries to project the past into the future and that's partly what creates the anxiety and the fear in the unknown. So when I teach, for those of you that have studied with me, you'll know that I emphasize this. I emphasize a phrase that I'm gonna share with you, which is, make the unknown known. So I'll say that again, make the unknown known. And this phrase is such a beautiful phrase because it helps orient us to things that we can possibly do to help calm this part of a child's brain. So for example, if we are about to wrap up in a play therapy session and all of a sudden I say, hey, we've got one more minute left, I have not addressed this particular fear in the brain. The child is not going to know what's going to happen next, potentially. And a child who has a lot of trauma in their history or just in general where transitions are challenging, which tends to be most children, um, not knowing what's going to happen next can often be one of the reasons why children have a hard time moving from the playroom back out into the waiting room. So we're going to take this idea of make the unknown known and we're going to apply it to the ending of sessions. So what that literally means is that children need a countdown. And I've seen this happen so many times where the play therapist does provide a countdown, but it's not a real countdown. What I mean is that somehow time speeds up. So 10 minutes isn't really 10 minutes. It's like 10 minutes and then five minutes and then two minutes and then one minute because the therapist wants to get out of there. And, and I'm going to caution us from doing this because part of also giving a child that time frame, you've got 10 minutes left, you've got five minutes left. When we do it every single week, it actually helps orient them to their own internal clock so that they can begin to pace themselves and learn how to modulate endings internally and begin to actually wrap up emotionally what they were working on. Otherwise, it feels really jarring and it's like they can't really get a sense of, all right, how much time do I really have to create some closure to what it is that I've been working on uh, since, you know, during this particular play therapy session. So we're going to give a countdown, but we're going to give a real countdown. And um, I highly encourage you when you give the countdown to say the child's name. I don't often use the child's name in other parts of the play therapy session because in the play, maybe the child isn't them um, or my actually my other reason is that oftentimes a child is so deep in their process. What I find is that when I say their name, it's almost like they pop out of their experience, which is deeply rooted in the right brain limbic area of the brain, and they pop into their prefrontal cortex, like back to reality for a second. Can be very useful if a child's flooding, but in general, I don't typically use a child's name in a session. But I do because I want to begin to orient them out of their experience as we're creating closure and wrapping up. So I might say something like, Billy, we have 10 minutes left. And then I might say that at 10 minutes. And then I'm going to start to address making the unknown known. So at five minutes, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Billy, in five minutes, we're going to clean up 
and then we're going to go out into the hallway we're going to get your treasure which I'll be talking about later in this podcast and then we're going to find your mom in the waiting room so when you are um, ending with a child transition them all the way in your language from what's going to happen the moment that it's time to end until they go out and they meet their parents um, or whoever it is that's picking them up so they know exactly the order and what's going to come next. I can't tell you how many times just using that strategy has helped a child be able to transition because they just wanted to know. And by the way, if you have the child after sessions that goes out to the waiting room or meets up with their caregiver or their parents and is constantly saying things like, what are we going to go do now? What are we going to go do now? Are we going to go home now? What are we going to go do now? That's the kid that you really need to pay attention to that needs this type of language the most. They need to know what's, what's happening next. It also just helps them orient in the transition itself. So to review, we're going to give a 10 five, four, three, two, one, countdown. We're going to say their name to help them orient out of um, the play a bit back into their prefrontal cortex so that they can begin to shift from the experience that they've been trying to work through in the playroom. At which point, um, when we give this language of um, letting them know how much time, we're going to follow our language all the way through so that they know what's happening on the other side. So hopefully you found something in there that might be useful for you when you are trying to transition from the playroom. Now I'm going to say a couple more things about this. I've also witnessed play therapists attempt to do this, but they're still kind of in play mode, like play mode, like, hey, it's, you know, um, we, we just have a couple minutes left. Okay, a couple minutes isn't really clear or we have five or six minutes left. Okay, five or six minutes isn't clear. How much time do they really have? And when you, when you say what you're gonna say, come out of the play yourself. I've seen kids that sort of like, they don't even hear it because it's said either um, in the context of the play, the energy didn't really shift. Um, and so the, the kid didn't really know, oh, wait, a transition's actually about to happen. It's almost like the words just sort of went in one ear and rolled right out the other ear. So make sure you're actually sort of pausing and orienting to the child so the child knows that you're serious here for a second. The other thing is that when it comes time to, um, to be done, the other thing that I see play therapists do is they keep playing. Time's up means time's up. That means stop playing. Um, now the child may keep playing because they're having a hard time transitioning, but you need to stop playing. Um, and at that point, don't engage back in the play. If a child knows you're gonna engage back in the play, then they know that they can keep going with whatever it is that they're doing. So what I find is really, really helpful is I can to orient to the child. So, hey, Billy, and this is acknowledge and redirect, which is the type of boundary setting that um, we advocate for and we teach in synergetic play therapy. So you're acknowledging, it's really hard to leave today. You worked really hard today. Um, or you're in the middle of doing that art project and I get it, you don't want to go. You want to finish it. So acknowledging it and then redirect, which sounds like, and it's time to clean up and go. Um, over and over and over again, so the child knows that you're serious. Now I'm gonna say another piece here too, which is that if you're not serious, the child can't feel you. And the child needs to be able to feel you in order to take you seriously. Um, this is also something we can teach parents when they are um, needing to help a child in a transition. Now, I'm not saying be mean to the child. I'm not saying um, talk harshly to a child. You can be incredibly nurturing and be very firm at the same time. So I'm going to take a deep breath here just to model this. So let's say kiddo is not finishing or not, not wanting to end. I may go over and I may say again, Billy, again, saying the name, 
I may try to make eye contact with the child. I don't want to overwhelm the child, but I may try to make eye contact with the child. I get it. You want to finish what you're doing. It's really hard to let it go. And it's time to go. It's time to clean up. It's time to go. We're going to stand up. We're going to go and get your treasure. We're going to go find your mom. And at that point, I'm not engaging in the play anymore. Um, I may open the door. Um, I may even stand up. Um, but it's important that you help the child understand at that point that, that you're serious. Now, I will tell you that if you work really hard at having a really solid countdown, that doesn't happen too often. So that's another little piece in there that can be helpful when you're navigating those tricky situations. And again, you may have your own really cool, fun ideas. I know some therapists create ritual at the end, which is really, really helpful. They have a snack at the end. They read a story at the end. Some play therapists will do a little EMDR resourcing at the end. Um, find find your way, but uh, hopefully something I've said here can be useful in adding to what you've already done if this part of the process is a little bit challenging um, for you. Now, the next question I'm going to address is cleaning up or not. Now, um, for me, this is very much a question that I ask based on the child that I'm working with. I don't expect every child to help me clean up. To me, it's is it therapeutic or not to have the child clean up? So for example, if I have Billy who's incredibly hyper aroused and part of what he needs to work on is containment, then he may be a kiddo that I have clean up. I will be doing a podcast at some point, I think just on this topic of cleaning up and ideas behind it and how to navigate that because I think there's more more to that picture that we could go into. But for this podcast, I'm just going to say that I think it's important that we look at it more as a, is it useful therapeutically based on what the child is trying to learn and accomplish. Now, Let's say that you are at the point where you have determined that it is time for the child to transition out of play therapy. The goals have been met. Um, you're seeing empowerment in the room. If you don't know how to recognize empowerment, please check out the podcast episode called Recognizing Empowerment that can offer you some tools. I'm going to say this. This is really important don't end prematurely. The child's emotional age and their chronological age being the same is what's going to be the really big indicator along with the goals have been met. That means yes, this child is fully, fully ready to terminate. I've seen many play therapists terminate early because they saw empowerment, but an empowerment was at an earlier emotional or developmental stage not at the chronological stage. And so even though they healed something, there was actually still more work to do. And then you get a phone call six months later because the next piece of the puzzle has revealed itself, which is fine as well. But just note that the emotional age and the chronological age, you want those to be the same. If you don't know how to assess the emotional age, consider joining me at some point when I teach my course called Growing Up in Play Therapy. It's a six hour course. We do it online um, and via webinar and there's a live component. So it doesn't matter where you are, where I go through six hours of helping you understand emotional age and what it looks like in the room through discussion and video and teaching you how to see the developmental stages in the process. Super cool, fun stuff. But let's say that you've arrived at the place where you've determined that yes, it's time for this child to transition. At that point, I'm going to encourage you to have three more sessions. And I'm saying this from a neuroscience lens. We spend a significant amount of time trying to rework the neural pathways around the things that did not go well for the child. And we don't spend enough time in the play therapy process myelinating and strengthening the neural pathway pathways around I'm okay. It is so useful to have sessions where you're not working on anything. You are truly in there just hanging out together, 
being together, regulating together, um, being playful together, and you're not working on something that feels challenging or intense, that builds and strengthens the work that you've been doing. And like I said, myelinates the new neuronal pathways in the brain towards empowerment, towards all the stuff that you've been working towards. So don't don't, don't uh, keep those out of the play therapy process. Those are incredibly important to have. So three times at that point, I'm going to be talking with the parents. And I really want the parents on board with this. I want the parents to be discussing with the child um, the fact that we only have three more times to see Lisa. And then have the parent discuss this over and over again so that the child isn't just hearing it from me. And then at the beginning of each session, I'm going to say something to the child. Hey, buddy, we've got three more times to play together. Right? And then the next one, hey, buddy, we've got two more times. Today's our last session to play together. Because I want the child, I don't, I want to practice having a conscious goodbye. I want the child to be able to process with me whatever it is that's coming up for them around the experience of ending things with me. I also don't want to make the assumption that it's a huge deal for them either. They may be ready to go. So I'm going to put it out there and then I'm going to watch and see what they do with it. Um, And then I'm not going to push to create some kind of closure, if you will, because the child may already be there. Now, I'm going to continue on here in this um, in this discussion. I realize that I'm throwing out tons of information in this particular topic, and feel free to listen to this over and over and over again. Um, but there's just so many different ideas for how to do goodbyes and endings. You can get so creative with it. Now, I don't know about you, but I often have no idea if my session with the child is ultimately going to be their last session because. I don't know if you've noticed this, but life happens for the families that uh, we're working with. So all of a sudden there's a move or all of a sudden something happened and the child uh, became sick. They started missing a handful of appointments and then they just don't come back. Or uh, financially the family got to a point where they just said, we can't afford this anymore and they weren't willing to even have a closure session. Or um, someone passes away and then just energy in the family is just redirected somewhere else and there's just not the, the time to bring the child in at that time. Things happen. So we don't always know that we're gonna see the child one more time. And so because of that, I really love to treat each session as its own session. So I absolutely love using transition objects. So in our hallway here at the Play Therapy Institute, which is outside of my office, the hallway that I'm speaking of, there's a shelf that we've sort of put up high. And on the shelf is, you look at it as like a treasure box, if you will. But what's inside are those like glass beads. They're multi multicolored. You would uh, put them maybe at the bottom of a fish tank or in a vase for flowers, if you know what I'm talking about. They're super inexpensive. You can get them at um, you know any kind of craft store. Super inexpensive, and they're really beautiful. And they look like treasures. It's not a sticker. It's not a plastic toy. It looks like a treasure. And so whenever a child comes to play therapy, what I will do is at the end of the session as part of our ritual and also part of the way that I help them transition out of the playroom is that we go get a treasure together and they get to go and pick out a treasure. I love the metaphor of this because what it means is when you come to play therapy, you collect, you collect treasure, you collect part of yourself. Sometimes I will even give the idea to the child and the parent at the first session to together find a, a place at home or go buy something because they're going, the kiddo's going to be collecting some treasure. And so let's find a really special place for this. And I can't tell you over the years how many phone calls I have received from parents saying, 
hey, I just want to let you know that we were moving and we packed up and we came across one of the treasures you gave so and so, so and so, and he lit up and he couldn't stop talking about his time with you. And uh, thank you so much. The, the kids collect them and it's not something that they tend to throw away because it looks meaningful, because it is meaningful. Again, different than stickers or something uh, plastic that, that does tend to go in the trash can over a period of time. Or a snack, which is useful, but again, it's not so much a transition object, something that they can hold on to. The child also then gets to take part of me and part of the session home with them in the event that they never come back. So in a sense, we've already said our goodbye. We've already had our closure for that session. So I don't do a big gift at the end of a process with a kiddo because they've been collecting gifts along the way. It's also the same gift for all kids that come here so that if you happen to work with a family who refers their best friend, you don't have the kids talking about, hey, you gave so-and-so this, or I wanna get this. All kids get treasure and they get the same treasure. They get to choose the, which color they want, but it's not something where you're going to have kids coming in and comparing what they got with other kids that maybe uh, you've seen that are their friends. So I'm a huge fan of finding a transition object, something that looks beautiful, a gem, a stone, uh, the glass beads, putting it somewhere outside of your play therapy office, your room to support the child actually leaving the room when it's time to end. And then from there, being able to um, acknowledge the work that you did together, that there is a transition object that the child gets to go home with, and no matter what happens from that point forward, they have you with them. So. Thank you so much for joining me today on this episode where we discussed endings and transitions and transitioned objects, and I know I packed a lot in. If there are topics that you would absolutely love to hear, please send us an email. I love to create these episodes based on the topics that you, the listener, would love me to speak about. For more information on our courses and our classes, please go to our website at synergeticplaytherapy.com and check out what we have available to you. And as always, remember that you're the most important toy in that playroom. <laughs>